Thank you. The next item of business today is topical questions, and question number one is from Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken to reduce the number of near misses that are being recorded by police control rooms. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, police Scotland continues to take action to strengthen its approach to call handling. The decision to systematically record notable incidents is a direct response to one of the 30 recommendations contained in HMICS November 2015 Assurance Review on police call handling. The Inspectorate has identified that such a process is crucial to creating a learning environment that improves processes and mitigates against risk. The Scottish Police Authority continue to oversee Police Scotland's process in this regard and to provide assurance around the service's ongoing performance in relation to call handling more generally. HMICS has confirmed it will publish an update report on police call handling in January 2017 and we would expect both Police Scotland and the SPA to give careful consideration to any further findings or recommendations arising from that report. I want to take this opportunity to recognise the valuable contribution made by police call handlers in responding to over 2.5 million 101 calls and around half a million emergency calls received by the service each year, often supporting members of the public at times of acute crisis. The notable incidents information released last week highlights that these occur in only around one in every 22,500 calls. And I welcome the fact that action is being taken to understand and respond to instances where the service to the public has fallen short of what would be expected. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Sec Secretary for that uh, detailed response? I think he's right in setting uh, these figures in, in context, uh, as well as to pay tribute uh, to call handlers and staff involved. But I think looking at the detail of some of those uh, cases registered between April and October, I think he'll agree uh, a number involve um, fairly serious uh, uh, issues, the locations of incidents being incorrectly logged, um, a two-week delay in uh, checking on the welfare of a child due to a misplaced report, and in response to one threat to life reported four times, the caller was told there were no officers available. One of the primary concerns that many had about the closure of local control rooms, with calls in, uh, being answered increasingly closer to the central belt, was the loss of local knowledge. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore tell me how the loss of staff, with in some cases decades of experience and detailed knowledge of their patch, uh, has been mitigated? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member uh, needs to recognise that when Police Scotland was established, there were uh, some 18 uh, call centres across the country, many with IT systems that didn't actually link into one another, couldn't record vulnerability, weren't able to share intelligence, uh, and therefore we had a system that wasn't fit for purpose in moving forward to deliver the services to the public that was necessary. But the member will also recognise that in the cases which were logged, where there has uh, been an error that has occurred, where there is an issue about concern as to the impact it may have had on a member of the public, if it is serious enough, then the matter is investigated by in a few of these instances, that's what has uh, happened. But the uh, purpose behind the recording of uh, notable incidents is to make sure that where an error has occurred, so for example, if it's the wrong details that have been entered into the system by logging in the wrong code, or whether they have failed to actually dispatch uh, officers to a particular incident when it's been received, is to make sure that that information is captured and that they then learn from the lessons that can be gained where that is necessary to ensure that that is minimised in the future. So this is about trying to make sure that there's the right environment within our call centres to allow staff to be, able to, uh, to be able to provide information where they think an error has been made. The member will also be aware of the 30 recommendations, or if he's not, he should be, of the 30 recommendations that were made by HMICS last year. Recommendation number 12 was one which specifically asked Police Scotland to review its present staffing model for its call centres in Scotland. That piece of work uh, has already been uh, completed and the Police Scotland are now implementing that in terms of the staffing of call, the call centres. So there's a significant body of work that has been taken forward over the course of the last year. And I've got no doubt that Police Scotland will continue to do that, make sure there's appropriate assurance and review of that process, as there is through the Scottish Police Authority and independent assurance, which I've directed through HMICS. Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that further detailed response and, and, and certainly the, uh, the encouragement offered about the way in which Police Scotland are taking forward the recommendations uh, that he outlined. Uh, of course, these statistics uh, were only released to the BBC after the Scottish Information Commissioner uh, ordered them uh, to be so. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that these figures should be routinely pu published uh, as a matter of course in order to aid both public scrutiny uh, and indeed provide wider uh, reassurance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, an issue of uh, the Freedom of Information uh, requests, I think it's, um, it's worth recording in Parliament, the public body in Scotland that deals with more Freedom of Information requests than any other part of the public sector is uh, Police Scotland. And one of the pieces of work which they are undertaking at the present moment is looking at what information can they put readily into the public domain. Uh, that would not require a Freedom of Information request uh, to be uh, necessary. This is some of the information which they are presently considering. But it is worth also keeping in mind is that Police Scotland are still developing the notable in incident process. It is a, a system which is going to be reviewed uh, as HMICS have already identified that they will review as part of their ongoing assurance review. Uh, so it is a piece of work which they are still taking forward. And I have got no doubt once that process is being completed, they'll be looking to see what information they can put in the public domain to give continued reassurance about the way in which their call centres are operating. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this year, Chief Superintendent Campbell Thompson, Divisional Commander of A Division, which includes Murray, said, and I quote, there have been a number of challenges relating to the recruitment and retention of police staff controllers. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament what action was taken to address this issue? And does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the concerns held by local communities about continued centralisation of this vital function of Police Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the first thing I would say is that I'm not sure whether the member is suggesting that we retained the old model where we had 18 call centres that didn't have IT systems that could actually uh, cooperate with one another and which did not, were not able to share the right intelligence across them because that was not a system that was fit for purpose. And also, the model which has been taken forward by uh, Police Scotland, having been reviewed by HMICS, has actually said it's an appropriate model for the delivery of the services in Scotland. And as the member, uh, I know he wasn't in the previous parliament, but as the member uh, should be aware, uh, recommendation 12 within HMICS's assurance review that I directed last year uh, made the recommendation of reviewing the modelling of staff being provided within the call centres. That work has now been completed and Police Scotland are now implementing its recommendations to make sure that the staffing ratios which they have within the call centres are suitable to meet the needs and the demands of the service. Ben McPherson. Thank you. As referred to in his answer to Liam MacArthur, can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on Police Scotland's progress in implementing the 30 recommendations contained in the HMICS Assurance Review on Call Handling? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Senior Officers, members may be aware the Assurance Review it took place as a result of the direction I gave to HMICS and the 30 recommendations that were published last November are areas of work which Police Scotland have now been taken forward. Some of those recommendations go beyond call handling in itself. There are other aspects of how the police service operates with its contact, command and control uh, centres. Uh, HMICS have confirmed that they will provide an update uh, in January 2017. That will be uh, laid before Parliament and members will then be able to see what progress has been made against each of those recommendations and whether there's any further recommendations or pieces of work which HMICS are recommending that Police Scotland take forward. But what I can assure the member of is that those recommendations are under constant scrutiny by HMICS, by the SPA, Governance and Assurance at Review Group, that are also responsible for this piece of work, and also external assurance that's been provided by, by, to Police Scotland to ensure that they are doing everything possible to implement these recommendations effectively. Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Sorry. <coughs> um, whilst I appreciate that the vast majority of cases were properly dealt with, as Liam MacArthur stated, a number of near misses had serious consequences. And HMICS will be following up last year's report into call handling with a more detailed report into each notable incident, a report which is due next month. And when published, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to coming back to this Parliament to update us and assure Parliament that all possible action has been taken to address any concerns the HMICS and the wider public may still have? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm happy to do so if members would find that uh, useful because it will allow members to get a, a, a 
uh, full update on where Police Scotland are in taking forward those uh, 30 recommendations. It's also worth keeping in mind that as part of the assurance process, I also directed HMICS to undertake unannounced inspections in the call handling con contact and control uh, centres to make sure that there was continued review of the way in which Police Scotland were handling calls and the way in which their centres were operating. That continues to take place uh, and HMICS are continuing to monitor these matters. But I'm, I've got no doubt that if uh, members would find it useful to have uh, an update uh, once, the, uh, once HMICS uh, update report has been provided, then I'm uh, more than happy to look at facilitating that for Parliament and for members. <coughs> Question number two, Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the expected impact on health will be from the ban on smoking in cars with children present. Minister Eileen, Cam Eileen Campbell. Okay. The overall health of children will be improved by reducing their exposure to the harmful effects of secondhand smoke in cars. Secondhand smoke can have serious negative health impacts on a child, including coughing, wheezing, asthma, middle ear disease, and respiratory tract infections such as bronchitis and pneumonia. Marie Todd. I thank the Minister for that answer and for the steps that this Government is taking to protect children from the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. It sends a clear message that children in Scotland should be growing up in a healthy, smoke-free environment. How will the Scottish Government monitor the effectiveness of the legislation and, over the longer term, will it review the penalties available, whether the penalties available are providing a useful deterrent? Minister. Um, before I respond uh, in detail to the supplementary from Marie Todd, I just wanted to, uh, in noticing our Liberal Democrat colleagues in the Chamber, put on record our thanks to Jim Hume for his work in the previous Parliament in bringing forward the original Members' Bill on this. Um, before I talk around the we will monitor it, I just wanted to highlight the more general approach that we're taking around ways to reduce the harm caused by tobacco. Our Take It Right Outside campaign encourages adults to smoke outdoors and that's helped us reach our target of reducing children's exposures to secondhand smoke from 11% in 2013 to 6% in 2020. And while we've reached that target five years early, uh, the legislation uh, that, we, um, that started yesterday demonstrates that our commitment to continuing to push this further. We're also increasing restrictions on the sale and purchase of tobacco and electronic cigarettes by under 18s, limiting the advertising of these products and bringing a mandatory ban on smoking near hospital buildings to further protect people from the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. We're also examining proposals to extend the current ban on smoking in enclosed public spaces to prisons. Uh, and working with partners in environmental health, the NHS and others, we will continue to monitor the effectiveness of our legislation and consider what further steps should or could be taken to ensure that we create a ta tobacco-free generation by 2034. Marie Todd. Thank you, Minister. I was going to go on to state that given the observation that children growing up with a parent or others who smoke around them are much more likely to become smokers themselves and that two-thirds of adult smokers say they started smoking as children, um, we can make a real impact on future health by protecting children from tobacco. And I was going to ask you to um, tell us what wider action the Scottish Government is taking to create a tobacco-free generation in Scotland by 2034. But I think you may just have answered my question. I'm not sure if there's anything more you want to say. Minister. I can add to that range of different activities that were taken to, to, uh, to, to let uh, Marie Todd know that, um, in addition, smoking cessation advice and support is available also to all pregnant women in Scotland to help ensure that each child has the healthiest start to life. So there are a range of uh, activities that were taken forward to ensure that we have a generation that's tobacco free by 2034. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to extend my thanks to the Minister for her recognition of the work of my good friend Jim Hume and the Liberal Democrats in stewarding this bill uh, through the Scottish Parliament. As Minister for Public Health in the last session, Michael Matheson said, we have no current plans to consult on extending Scotland's smoke-free laws to private cars. Successful implementation of the smoking ban has undoubtedly already reduced exposure to secondhand smoke among children in Scotland. And yet today, we have this well-deserved fanfare and this beautiful SNP infographic claiming credit for it. Does the Minister agree that without the intervention of my good friend Jim Hume, we would not have uh, passed this last Landmark Act, and we would not be celebrating today the protection of tens of thousands of Scottish young people. Minister. So despite there was a 
degree of kind of friendliness, I suppose, at the start of that question, it descended into a bit of churlishness as well. I think, you know, when we remember how we came to vote on it, it was voted unanimously by each and every party across the chamber. And we're putting on record our thanks to Jim Hume. Of course, he came forward with the members' debate, but we'd already had a number of pieces of legislation in place to take forward our ambitions about having a smoke-free generation by 2034. Of course, much of that started by the previous administration, the Labour uh, government uh, as well. So I think across all of the parties, we have uh, worked hard to ensure that public health in Scotland can be improved and will continue, I hope, in the spirit of consensus to make sure that we can make further gains in public health in Scotland. Thank you, Minister. That concludes topical questions.